So we'll go ahead and get started. So Jeff, did you ever have any stigmas concerning mental health issues? Well, I would say, you know, absolutely not uh, for other people. And I think that was the key. You know, I mean, I uh, have worked with people that have, you know, worked on their mental health, had mental health issues. I've had people that, um, you know, uh, years ago that reported to me that I worked with and actually assisted them a, a couple of times when they, when they, you know, had some issues. Uh, so to me, it was like, it's no big deal. Uh, but I did have a stigma about myself. I'm a control freak. And with that, uh, I, it was okay not to have a stigma for somebody else, but I actually felt that I was probably weak, you know, if I had any mental health issues or sought assistance. And so I would say not for others, but for myself, I did have a stigma. Okay, well, what changed your opinion regarding that for the stigma upon yourself? Well, when I had contracted the West Nile disease, um, I had the most severe symptoms that you can have other than dying. And so with that, uh, my, my case was to be about one in a million. And with that, uh, there are many, many symptoms to West Nile. Um, you know, I overall, I have severe weakness. And of course, um, I lost the use of, of my legs. And even my upper body strength is, is not there. My lung capacity isn't there. It's just all sorts of things. Uh, but one of the things and one of the symptoms of West Nile is it produces high anxiety. And I've never experienced this. And uh, with that, it really changed my thought process of just at that time how, how helpless I was. All right. Can you describe overall how you felt during that time? Well, you know, it, it, it started probably uh, when I got to the hospital in Iowa City because the first thing they wanted to do is put me in and have an MRI done. And of course, I was a little bit concerned because everybody in the room was all masked up just like we would be today, you know, and with that, uh, they put me in a mask and they put me in the MRI. Now, I've had an MRI before when I had a hip replacement. And actually, it was kind of relaxing. You know, I mean, I lay down. I usually don't do that during the day. I would fall asleep, they get done the MRI, piece of cake. This situation was different. I was running a fever, I was hot, I was having trouble breathing. I was in there and every minute seemed like, you know, 15. They finally got done. I, I was really stressed out, which was so strange. And when I got out, one of the nurses or the practitioners said, well, I wonder if we should do another MRI with a contrast. And I still, at that time, I could still speak. I wasn't in intubated yet. And so with that, I, I said, well, wait a minute, did the doctor order a contrast? She said, no. I said, well, I'm not doing it, which would be so atypical of me. But uh, after that, um, I just steadily uh, went downhill. Um, I needed some treatments. I needed assistance. Certain things, certain of the rehab items just that I had trouble with, like trying to stand, uh, would really freak me out. Um, I had to go back and have another MRI. Uh, they, they told me that they could help me. They dosed me up with Ativan to the point that, uh, man, I was I was higher in a kite. But also, I, I actually asked for Ativan and other items the days I had to try and do some physical therapy because I really was struggling. Just to tell you how bad it was, um, I finally got to the point after about six weeks in the hospital that I could. Prior to that, I couldn't even watch TV. And my family brought over some videos that I've been watching, some DVDs and and uh, one was the Virginian series. And they plugged that in for me. It was, it was a little awkward to do in the hospital room I was in. They plugged that in and just the theme song stressed me out so much I couldn't watch it. So, so that's kind of where I was. And, and um, you know, subsequent to my recovery, or at least how far I recovered with that, uh, I learned that West now does produce very, very high anxiety. And that's not un un unusual in a severe West now case. So with your high anxiety, what kind of um, treatments did you receive for it, like medication or? Well, you know, it, it, when I was in the Iowa City Hospital, and remember I was intensive care there and then um, acute respiratory care. I was on the respiratory floor because I was you know, on a ventilator. Uh, with that, you know, I really didn't know what was going on so much, but uh, they did have me you know, on antidepressants. And I do know for a fact when I got out to Craig Hospital, um, at that time, uh, they, it was mandatory. If you, if you are, have a spinal injury, uh, which I have, it's not the typical traumatic injury from a car accident or from a fall where you break your back, 
but I had the same symptoms. And since I was a paraplegic and on a, resp a respirator, uh, it's just automatic. Uh, they would put you on a, a drug and antidepressant and what they had me on was Lexapro. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was intermittently taking uh, Ativan. But remember, when I was just taking it intermittently, there was days where, where I, I never got out of bed. And so maybe, you know, it's been a week, maybe it's 10 days since the therapist, because when I was on the respiratory floor, it wasn't a physical therapy situation, uh, but the therapist would come in and work with me and try to get me on a, on a table. It'd be like a gurney and it would tilt up to stand and, you know, my heart would race. Uh, I, I actually, one time they had me try and stand up and uh, physically and mentally, I, when I tried to stand up, my, my um, heart rate went zooming, but my blood pressure went crashing. And so basically I just, I just crashed and they got me seated back on the bed on this particular device. And afterwards, when they got me laid back down, when I finally you know, came around again, I said, when are they gonna try and get me to stand up? And my family said they already did it. But I was actually asking for, for something those mornings to take the edge off because you know, I was just so stressed out. So, so you know, I did take that, uh, it was on Lexapro uh, at the hospital. And also when I came home, and then I would also uh, meet with the uh, psychiatrist on a regular basis was on our team. And, you know, I probably even had a little aversion to that because I was there to physically get so I could walk out of that hospital. I didn't know why I needed to meet with these individuals. Uh, my case was different. And of course, really it's not if you're paraplegic and in the situation I was in, um, in some cases you're actually worse than somebody that, that has a, a spinal injury because many of those, depending upon where they have it, will actually get on their feet again. So this was, this was you know, what I was doing at that time and slowly, you know, I, I started to uh, recover uh, my abilities, you know, me my mental abilities, I guess I should say. So when you were receiving, I guess, those treatments, when you were meeting the psychiatrist to get like, you know, get yourself back up, you know, how did you feel during that time mentally? Like how, what, what were your thoughts, I guess, on your overall, how did you, yeah, how did you feel? Well, at first I have to sit down and say, you know, I, I actually, didn't know if I was really getting that much value. I mean, to me, the value was getting into the physical fitness room, having the physical therapist work with me, you know, trying to get on my feet. And that, that was the goal. I was gonna walk out of the Craig Hospital with a walker. That was my goal. Um, quickly, we learned and my family learned that the goal was to get me so I could function in society or function at home. Uh, that was the goal. You know, it would be great if I could walk, but it's more retraining those life skills. Uh, working with the, the uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, the thing, the things that I remember most about this process was, um, you know, having those heart to heart discussions and, and it still bothers me a little bit to this day, but uh, I was upset I was working out and by this time I'm, I'm recovered enough that I'm doing things, you know, and uh, maybe those be some of the photos staff might have seen of me when I was at the hospital in the gym equipment doing things and I was trying to work out and doing a, a, a seated bench press. Right? And with that, my back and wheelchair up and push the bar out. And you know what, I, I could hardly do 20 to 30 pounds. I mean, that, that's all bad, and it's still bad. It's, I'll never recover uh, those muscles, those nerves. And there was a young man that was a high school student that had defended a woman, a young lady, from, from a bully that was actually, you know, doing things he shouldn't be doing. And this bully said, next time I see you, I'm gonna break your neck. This is, it was a 19 year old boy. And um, I visited with his family many times and this guy next time he saw him and i don't think he really meant to break the guy's neck but he grabbed him sumo flexed him to the concrete and actually broke his neck and and so he wanted to be a mechanic and here i am trying to push 20 pounds of weight and he's a quad and he looks at me when i when i got when i moved and he was to his turn on the machine he said if i could just get use of my hands so i could become a mechanic. If I just could get use of my hands, that's all he wanted. And that just about broke me to tears. And so I, I shared that with, with, you know, with a psychiatrist. And I said, I said, you know, I feel so ashamed and it bothers me so much because I feel so bad for myself. And I've got a great compared to some of the people that I'm befriending, you know, and, and they, you know, at that time they were explaining to me that that's normal. That's a normal process. You're going to go through your own grieving through your loss. You know, don't feel uh, terrible about that. And, um, you know, and, and then and then later on, you know, through the whole process, you know, I was I, I, I finally got to feel like I was myself again. And, and I guess when when did you finally start to feel back to normal? Like what you know, what were some of the changes? You no, know, I, I, I think that 
I'll share this with you because I would imagine at that time nobody would really recognize me. I'm in, um, you know, uh, you know, during the, the worst times. Um, I still recall, and I recall for some reason the, the day very specifically. I I went and, and was getting my lunch in, in the cafeteria. Uh, there was a cafeteria on our floor just down the hall, and for some, and you know, for a lot of the lunches, uh, you know, my family would be there for certain things to help me and to also learn how to assist me when we returned home. But I had watched a gentleman that, um, and I could tell they have a vector and it's a machine where you put a harness on and it's got cables and it lifts you off your feet so you can go along and you could walk and it off loads a lot of your weight. And I saw this guy and I knew him from seeing him, him and his wife in the cafeteria. And I think I saw him the very first day that he was on that machine actually kind of walking. And so, I was sitting there and I had learned that his wife had gone home because he was going to get discharged in a couple weeks and she had to get the home ready for him. So he was by himself during lunch. And as I was eating my lunch, he sat down by himself. I finished and I went over to him. I said, excuse me. You know, I said, I've never met you. Um, and, and so so I, I said, I don't want you to think that I was just spying on you or I'm some kind of a creeper. But I think I saw you the first time you were on the vector and his eyes lit up. He said, yeah, that was so cool. And so he told me a story. Uh, he's a musician. Uh, he had retired early. He just, you know, looked away on a motorcycle and rear-ended a truck and, 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 and broke his spine. But you know what? So then the next time I saw him, I, I saw him uh, uh, doing uh, work on the parallel bars or and or with a walker. And, uh, you know, I would give him a thumbs up, you know, and all this. And it just it just felt normal for me. I mean, that was the first time I, I actually thought I was recovering uh, from my mental anxiety because I felt good helping somebody. I mean, I was just like, I didn't really do anything, but I talked to this person. He smiled when I shared my information with him. And so um, um, I immediately asked my wife if she could get me some Superman cards. And um, I would have said Superwoman as well, but at that time I said Superman cards. And she said, why? I said, I want to give these out every week to whoever I know that's working the hardest in the gym, working the hardest in physical therapy. Well, she didn't have any cards, but she said, well, she says, well, you know, my mom sent you a bunch of Superman socks and I can't wear them because I have to wear compression socks. And so I started handing those out to people, you know, when they had a, a really good week, you know, and that was a lot of fun and uh, it kind of became known for that. And that's when I knew I was back at least to myself as far as my mental abilities to say, I really care about people and, you know, I want to reach out to them and I'm just kind of that way anyway. So that's when I finally thought to myself, you know, I feel like that part of me is, is normal. I can't walk, I can't lift anything, I can't do anything, but you know what, uh, you know, at that point in time, I, I had to use a lift to transfer. I couldn't even move myself around. But at least at that time, I thought I'm reaching out to people and that's like me. And I felt good about that. And I felt I was getting back to my mental capabilities. That is so cool, Jeff. That's so cool. I mean, I, I bet that really pushed them to also, you know, continue to better themselves. Just that little uh, it, passing it, out the socks. Yeah, it was fun because they, the, the funnest was there was any and again, you know, really bothered me with, with young kids young kids by young kids i would mean you know lydia i'm sorry i'd probably call you a young kid if i saw you in the hospital. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. so I please consider that a compliment but um there was this one young lady that uh, was uh, they were um you know uh, sleigh riding in the sand dunes you know on cardboard and she just hit a tuft of grass or a rock and it tossed her and, and and she broke her neck and um you know she was she was probably in her, her earlier 20s early 20s and um uh, you know, I'd always, my, my daughter and I, uh, we would go into the gym and, you know, we got permission, but we kind of sneak into the fitness room. It was basically where they have all the therapy tables and equipment. And we would do extra work before supper, sometimes after supper, and, and we squeeze that in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, Lauren was always there and, and she was doing the same thing. And so I saw her the first time and she was really good. She, she really worked on stretching. She could do so much stuff. But anyway, I saw her the first day she was on a walker and I waited till her parents were there. Her brother was there, her fiance, who now she's married to. Great story there. I could tell someday. But uh, with that, I made sure I presented her, her socks uh, in front of her whole family in the cafeteria. And, and she looked at me. She says, well, the only reason, you know, I'm working so hard is because you and Jessica are in the gym at the same time. And I you know that, that was fun. That was fun. Oh, that's so cool. Very cool. I guess, so with all these experiences and going through this, did you ever get over your concerns about mental health when you were discharged? So like the stigma that surrounded you personally? 
Uh, yeah, I kind, of, I kind of have a yes and no answer. Um, yes, because, you know, I, I knew I was back to myself mentally. And so, you know, with that, I mean, I still, I still, you know, had sharpening to do, but when I was discharged, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I was functioning. I was catching up on email, which I probably shouldn't have been from Grinnell Mutual, but I could. Um, I, I was, I was, you know, writing some news articles or writing some things and, and, you know, do, doing a couple of videos. So, I mean, those things, and I, and I knew what was going on. I could catch up. And so I felt good about that finally, you know, for a while I couldn't. You know, for a while, I, I, I couldn't. Um, thank thank uh, the blessing Dave Winger helped me with my benefits because at the time, uh, when I started looking at my benefits, I I, I was I couldn't even navigate a laptop. You know, I mean, it was, it was just terrible. But as that came around, you know, I felt better. I also realized that 50% of West Nile patients suffer permanent cognitive disabilities and 50% have permanent depression issues. And so, you know, I, I felt good about that. Uh, but you know, I, st I still had the stigma because I wanted to get off of Lexapro. I want, I thought, well, I'm okay now. I want to get off the antidepressants. I don't like medications, you know, and and, may and I guess I still carried a stigma about taking the antidepressants. Uh, they would not take me off the antidepressants. And even when I worked with them, they, the bottom line, they said, uh, you're going to go outpatient for a month and live with your family. And when you're with your family and outpatient, even though you're just, you know, right across the street uh, from us in a housing complex, if something happens, uh, you fall, whatever, we can't help you. You got to call 911. You got to call emergency. They said there's going to be extra stress on you living on your own, and uh, with that, and not having the equipment and the nurses and the nurses' aides there the whole time. They said uh, we don't want to take you off of this because that's going to be a new stress load for you. And so we navigated that for a month, and I said well, I'm ready to come off of my Lexapro. Still had a little stigma, and they said no, you're going to go home. Now you're going to have more stress. And with that, uh, we'll wait till your physician does this. So finally, I'm visiting my physician, you know, you know, and I'm having less, you know, concerns about or stigmas, uh, but but they, you know, cut my dose in half and no no change and, and then eliminated it. And I, there was no change, you know, my my anxiety was gone, you know, but I still I still carried that, you know, and you know what? Um, while I was taking Lexapro, I don't think I could have sat down and told you that I was taking it. You know, I, I, I didn't know if that was really appropriate for me to try and be the CEO and, and you know, taking medication. And of course, that is that stigma I carried in, until today. Okay. So, I mean, that's all good, really good information. I'm, so, I guess, what are your thoughts now? Because, so you couldn't sit down and, and say you know that you were taking it what if someone came up to you and said they were taking it you, well, it you know? depend, yeah it would it would depend on too and i say i wouldn't talk about it you know for my family members it was fine etc but i wouldn't probably do it in a professional setting yeah. you know yeah. it, it, my attitude is totally different today totally yeah. different today because you know what i could function hopefully i think i would function the same today if i still had that anxiety but through counseling and medication it was under control. I don't think that would that would make a difference. And I know I, I wouldn't expect it to be a difference. And I would not give any different advice to anyone I knew that was saying that I was saying, hey, I don't think I want to take this. And I said, well, what do the doctors say? What where are you at in this? Well, I really need to, but I, you know, there's a stigma behind it. I says there shouldn't be. You should do what's good for your health. And I yeah. think that's that's where I finally have come around to within that because I question like, well, why did that bother me so much? Why should it bother me so much? You know, it, it really shouldn't have. And that was that stigma I carried on my own shoulders that I wouldn't put on anybody else. And then the other piece with that would be, you know, there's certain things. You know, I don't want to take any medication. But guess what? I got DVTs, you know, and uh, for my blood clots. And even there I was going through, and of course, I got to wear compression socks. I got to take Eliquist, you know, twice a day. And I was just waiting like, okay, so when I go get my, my um, you know, exam, and when they go through and do the ultrasounds on me and, and check, you know, I'm waiting and say, well, are they good enough now I can quit? And uh, they say, you will do this the rest of your life. Well, that's interesting. The other thing is I, uh, this West Now messed up my thyroid. I was take, I've, my medication has been cut into half uh, since I've returned, but that's been, you know, three years ago now. Mm -hmm. But with that, um, I'll probably be taking that the rest of my life. And you know what, it's funny because that just seems like, hey, that's par for the course. You know, I want to live and live healthy. I, I've got to take my uh, Eliquis so I don't get a blood clot. Maybe it kills me. 
you know, I got to take my thyroid medication so I can continue to be as active as I can be, you know, and, and, and to have that. And you know what? Today I would sit down and say, if I was taking Lexapro, I would be saying, well, it's just something Wes now created this with me or for whatever reason, I have this anxiety. And if I was taking it, I would I would share today with you that, you know, this is me. This is it's no different. It's just part of building your your, you know, your health, your health period, which can be physical health, which I deal with and can also be mental health. You know, it's just part of your health regimen. Definitely. Yes. That is, yes, it sure is. Um, okay, so what, what steps have you taken to continue to make your mental well-being an overall priority in your life? Well, I, I found that uh, if I don't do certain things, um, you know, I, I lose what, bil- what little ability I have. Uh, one of the things is, I, you know, I, I've got to get regular sleep, and I've also noticed that, that I've got to keep my same sleep patterns over the weekends, you know, even, even messing up and staying up an hour later and or trying to sleep in an hour later. Uh, messes me up. I've got I've got to you know stay stay on uh, proper nutrition. I, re- I really have to do that. And the other thing is um, I, I've got I've got to exercise. Uh, I, I have to do that. Uh, the pandemic has been was very hard on me. Um, you know they closed down the pools. And I got a lot of you know I was swimming at least once a week, and that was very good for me. Um, I purchased a ski erg machine. People can look that up. It's like a rowing machine that stands straight up, and you you um, pull down on cables. Uh, ropes like a like your Nordic skiing, but but it's a flywheel device, and I got one of those, and and uh, you know at the day before Christmas we set it up, and I could only go seven minutes, and I used to go 30 minutes and 4,700 meters, and and uh, Saturday I hit 4,600 meters and 30 30 minutes for the first time since awesome. a long That's time. Awesome. So, so so but but what I found was, and I would if you can do these things, what I found was doing that really gets my heart rate up that's the only way i can really elevate it. even swimming i can't swim fast enough or far enough uh to, to really elevate my my heart rate really high and uh, so doing that was you know i got done i was just totally exhausted i just collapsed over i couldn't even sit back up in the chair you know i was just doubled over for about you know i couldn't push myself back to sit up i was so tired and after i got done i thought man this is great i i feel good you know, I feel like I've got out and got a really workout. I mean, I just like yeah. my rest of the day felt really great. So I have to do those things. Uh, but the other thing is, I do have to work on my. I, I do have to work on my my depression, and by that I mean, I have to make sure I'm doing things. I have to I have to make sure I'm doing some things for others. I have to make sure I'm I'm you know uh, inflective upon myself and, and and thinking about things and and thinking about you know well what what will my life be ten years from now and what would I be doing and how will I you know, handle situations and how can I do this? And, and um, you know, and, and I and I had, um, when they shut down, they shut down the um, therapy pool here in town from the hospital. And, they, and then when the swimming pool shut down and I was doing a lot of traveling and as we went in the West Niles, uh, physically, I really deteriorated. And, um, you know, and, th- and then we hit the pandemic. And so, you know, I've been working um, hard to try and see, today's kind of a test day because, um, I'm going back to the therapist and getting in the water tank for the first time in over a year. Last time I saw my therapist, I saw her last, uh, excuse me, um, uh, last Monday, but prior to that, it was March 16th. Everybody remembers that day. That was the last time I saw my therapist. And so um, today, today we get the test to see just how far I've gone backwards uh, since, um, you know, the last time I worked out with her in the water tank. But uh, I'm hopeful that I can at least, my goal is, I at least hope I can stand up and then start trying to walk with, with, um, you know, only, you know, it takes off 70% of your body weight in a, in a water tank. So hopefully I can get back to that. But but those are the things I have to do. And and I am, I have to admit, as a control freak, uh, kind of anal on what I do. I, I like to see what I'm doing and, and see progression to the positive, even though I realize that, you know, there's a one in a million chance I'm going to walk again. Uh, but, you know, there's one in a million chance I was going to become a paraplegic from a mosquito bite. So so we'll, we'll keep a good attitude and, and keep moving forward. Yes, I love that, Jeff. Positivity. That's awesome. It's true. You can you you can do it. I mean, you never know. There's always that chance. Um, OK, so last question. So, you know, with all this, your experiences that you've had, especially with the West Nile virus, uh, do you have any advice that you would like to share with everyone else on proving your overall mental well-being? Well, you know, I, I really don't think and you got to realize we're, we're talking to somebody that's experienced what I've experienced. And so I really don't have 
the authority or knowledge to be giving advice, but I'll just say for myself, you know, in, in my view, you know, your health is your health. You know, you're responsible for it. And, and by that, I mean, you know, you may hear people that say things or have stigmas or, you know, about mental health or maybe their own issues, but but you know what? It's yours. It's, it's your health and you're responsible for it. So I think you need to use all the tools that are available. You know, that could be counseling, proper diet, exercise, and medication if prescribed. Like I said, um, you know, I think that my family and my friends would just be appalled if I said, well, I'm going to quit taking my Eliquis because I don't want to take medication. I don't want to be dependent upon any medication. You know, and they say, well, you know, it's so you want to have a, you know, a, a blood clot in your lung or your brain. Is that what you're trying to do? You know, you would say that's, that's ridiculous. So, so I think you have to, to look at all those things and say, how do I keep my health? And for mental health, you know, counseling is an item. I've done that. Uh, I've taken antidepressant and it helped me in, in a very difficult time. And quite frankly, um, I think I've grown enough. I think I can confidently say that for some reason I had to go back to take antidepressants again. You know, I would share it. I, you know, I would say, well, I would share it because you know what? What difference does it make? And quite frankly, if my ability to operate here at Grinnell Mutual, let's say my cognitive ability was affected by this, you know what? That everybody would know it anyway. So what difference does it make? So that's why I feel about that. And I don't think we need to be concerned about what others think about us or about you, you know, or what they say. You know, I, I think the vast majority, think about this, the vast majority of people have to be very ignorant about the topic, but also ignorant about your situation. Nobody knows your situation like you do. You know, maybe you're medical professionals, but even they don't know exactly what you're thinking and what you're feeling. You can share it, but, it, but it's hard. So you have to be your advocate. And again, if that would happen, and, and um, you know, it's like somebody that this say had a stigma about a paraplegic or something like that, I, I would just, I'm, I'm going to feel sorry for them. Um, I'm going to feel sorry for them that that they don't understand these situations. I'm not going to be angry with them, uh, but I'm just happy that these tools are available. And I would say to you know everybody out there that no matter what you're doing for your physical health, your mental health, your social health. You know, there's many tools out there to assist you and, and, and take advantage of them. You know, take advantage of them because they're available to help you. And um, that's, to me, that's the most important thing. And don't let anybody else deter you from what you know you need to do to help yourself, no matter what that is. And that could be, my family was great. My Grinnell Mutual family was great. So many people supported me. But I'll tell you what, if someone didn't, I would just say, well, they don't understand. You know, that's too bad. And I, it wouldn't deter me one bit. Jeff, thank you so much. This was very inspirational. And it's, again, as I said at the beginning, so awesome that you were able to open up and share your experiences because it will only help others, hopefully, to also come forward and talk about their experiences or share their 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 issues that they might be struggling with to, to help them, you know, just become overall healthier. So, well, well Lydia, when you, when you lost your, um, uh, you and your team lost that guest speaker last week, uh, within that, um, this came to mind, maybe I could do this. And it also kind of haunted me because I think at one time when I was talking in front of a town hall, when I came back, I said I would share everything about my experience except for one. Mm -hmm. and I, I wasn't ready to share that yet. Well, today you you had a chance to hear that one thing. That was the one thing that I wasn't going to share at that time. And, and uh, uh, with, with that, I think it was, you know, it wasn't that it bothered me, it's maybe a little bit, but then I didn't know what people would really think. But today I would share that one thing. And I think I've grown because of that, you know, about the issues people face with mental health and how it is just like any other health issue and treat it as such. I very much agree. Very much agree. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate all you do. And again, thanks for doing this.